today I'm at Lewis Landing Park. I am going to have an interview with a meteorologist, a weather scientist. Let's go. What is weather? So weather is the day-to-day -day aspect of what's happening in the atmosphere from winds to clouds to humidity to the pressure content of what's happening, whether it's raining, whether it's sunny, is it snowing, is it not? And it's generally about a three to five day outlook of what's happening in the current state of the atmosphere. And the way that we differentiate that from climate, just because this is a huge question we often get asked, is climate is the overall average. So one of the best ways you can think about this is weather is your mood and climate is your personality. So what are some weather hazards here in Florida we need to look out for? Well, as you know, lightning is a huge problem that we have here in Florida. It is, is the lightning capital of the world. Now, Florida has also got a high number of tornadoes. And while they may not be the kind of tornadoes we're used to seeing up in the Central Plains, we do get a high number of tornadoes in the state. And of course, our biggest threat is that coming from the hurricanes during hurricane season, which as Florida sticks out in the ocean like a thumb, we're very susceptible to oncoming storm systems. Oh, so what is a hurricane exactly? So a hurricane is a closed area of low pressure relative to the surroundings. So if you have higher pressure around the region and lower pressure in the center of the storm, which is otherwise known as the eye, uh, the clouds forming around this become the eye wall. And what happens is, is that winds continue to feed into the system, including a wraparound feature, which is often associated with the pictures that we see on satellite images, the kind of pictures that make hurricanes somewhat famous. So hurricanes are a warm core system that are a circulation of clouds and precipitation. Do you have a picture of a hurricane to show us? Absolutely. I did bring with one with me today. So this is a picture of Tropical Storm Isaac, which was located in the Gulf of Mexico in 2012. And this is the actual wraparound feature that we were speaking of earlier. So tropical systems or cyclones as they are known around the world, we call them hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin. Otherwise, you may hear them as cyclones or typhoons in different parts of the world. This particular cyclone, or hurricanes in general, that move over the no in the northern hemisphere actually rotate in a counterclockwise pattern. So you can see the wind swirls or the cloud swirling pattern as they move inwards towards the eye. So pressure moves from high to low values, and this is why you have this wraparound feature as the winds are driving the system from the higher surrounding pressure into the eye of the lower pressure of the system. So what is this uh, category scale of the hurricane? So this is called the Saffir Simpson scale and what this is is a measurement of the winds and the central pressure of these storm systems. And in the Atlantic Ocean this ranges from a 1 to a 5 where category 1 being the weakest of the systems and category 5 being the strongest of the systems. So what would category 5 do to a region like Fort Lauderdale or Wilton Manor? Okay, so a category 5 system is going to have extremely strong winds and low pressure values uh, depending on the direction that it's coming in towards the state itself and depending on the building codes and the way that the location is boarded up or if it's not, you would probably look at a lot of widespread destruction. So we would need to like go in the shelter if there's a hurricane like that or evacuate? I would suggest that if you live in a house in which the building codes have not been caught up to date, evacuation, if, if at all possible, is your likely, likely best thing to do. If evacuation is not possible, as in maybe you can't get somewhere or you, the decision hasn't been made in enough time, a local shelter would be a great way to go. Because they have a building code that protects against the winds and stuff? Absolutely. So post Hurricane Andrew in 1992, building codes in Florida had been tightened down a lot where uh, it had actually made it a lot harder for inspections to pass if it did not reach a certain requirement for safety with hurricanes. So now what's the lightning about? Like how is it dangerous in the capital of Florida? Okay, so when I reference that light, uh, Florida is the lightning capital of, this, of the world, what that means is that we have a high density amount of lightning strikes that occur throughout the state. 
And one of the reasons that lightning is so dangerous is because it's not necessarily always associated with the storm system that might be right over you. While the average lightning bolt can travel up to maybe 10 miles away from the system, it has been known to travel as far as 200 miles away. So that whole idea of the bolt from the blue is actually a very factual thing in which you can be struck by lightning even if you have blue skies. If there is a storm system, that's far enough away to produce a lightning bolt. Um, one of the things is, is that lightning is always looking for the highest potential point in which to match. So even if there are trees around you or something else taller, that doesn't necessarily make you, st you safe because once it travels into the ground, you can still be shocked by it traveling through the ground itself. So this palm would be a good example here of a lightning post, right? Because yes. Because it's tall. Absolutely. This is something that could very easily attract lightning as a result of being so high up off the ground. Now your safest bet when you do have lightning threatening is to get somewhere indoors where you have a least likely chance to get hit. If you cannot make it indoors, let's say you're at the beach and there's no shelter to cover, uh, you would definitely want to try to get in your car as fast as you can or some other form of method in which you are protected. Now even being in the car, one of the biggest things that a lot of people assume is, is that the tires of the car are what are keeping you safe because of the rubber. And this is actually not true. What's keeping you safe is that the car's cage is a metal cage, so to speak, and this is otherwise functions as a Faraday cage, which the lightning hits the top of the car, travels through the metal, and then enters into the ground. So if you are in the car, it's important to make sure that the windows are rolled up and you're not touching any car, any part of the body of the vehicle itself. Except the chair, it's a chair safe? Your chair is safe. As long as you are inside the cage, think of a bird inside of a cage. Yeah. If the lightning was to hit it, it would travel on the outsides of the cage before it enters into the ground. So why are tornadoes dangerous here? Now tornadoes here in Florida are dangerous because basically these are extremely strong wind speeds that are associated with these systems. Now, because we are surrounded by so much water here in Florida, water spouts is also something that we need to be concerned with. And these are actually cloud to ocean forming tornado-like systems that can then move onshore or remain offshore. So is there like a difference between water spouts and tornadoes on land or same thing? It's basically the same thing. The major difference being that one is over water and one is over land. So one thing I wanna know is, how does a fire tornado form? A fire tornado? Well, let's, let's go back for a second and dissect the idea of exactly what a tornado is. So this is a violently rotating column of air by definition. And essentially what happens is, is a tornado is just air rotating around and air is invisible. You can't actually see a tornado unless it moves over something that it picks up, such as dirt. Uh, if it's a water spout, it's usually because it's picking up the water, which is often why you see water spouts having that kind of grayish, bluish water, that color, because it's, it's being kind of colorized by the water that it's picking up. So a fire tornado would be that rapidly rotating column of air that just happens to move over a region of fire, and it picks up the fire, and that's actually what colors the tornado itself. Like this? Just like that. I remember we did this. Yes, we did. If you shake it, it's supposed to spin, like the fire tornado. Uh, so what can you do to protect ourselves and pets against tornadoes? One of the safest things to do is to, number one, stay aware of activity. So if you know that there's a day in which severe weather is threatening or your local meteorologist has indicated that it's a chance or a higher chance of severe weather, stay aware. Having a NOAA radio or some way to actually gather information is key. Once there is an actual threat to a tornado, the safest thing for you to do is to put as many walls between yourself and the outside. So you wanna to try to find an interior room in your house in which there's little windows as possible, or hopefully no windows. Oftentimes this can be a bathroom. Now if you happen to have a bathroom that has windows and you're looking for somewhere else, maybe even under a staircase, or something in which, again, you put as much distance between you and the outside environment. So are there any other weather hazards in Florida but hurricanes, tornadoes, and lightning? Well, we're often threatened with such beautiful, fantastic weather here. I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> we have the best of both worlds here. Heat is also something that we need to be careful of. As we move into the spring, especially into the summer months, um, heat exhaustion and heat stroke is a huge factor here, especially for those that are susceptible, like young kids and the elderly. So how can we prepare ourselves to weather? Like, the same way to predict? or exactly know when they're coming? 
depending on the actual event that you're referring to, you know, your biggest key is to have a trusted source that you can go to. If this is not your local news, it's the Hurricane Center, it's the National Weather Service, which has many different offices around the country. And so you can always go to their website. If you are on social media, you can always follow trusted sources via Twitter or Facebook or any other means in which they propagate this information out to the general public. Uh, staying aware is key and making sure that you are on top of that and have a trusted source and the ability to listen to this information is always the best way to go for preparation. Uh, what is it like being a meteorologist? Well, I for one, I love what I do. I think that uh, for me, I, I have a huge respect for the energy that what nature portrays. And so for me, being a meteorologist is the ability to actually observe this energy and watch it turn into something on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I really love the idea of physics. I love the idea of weather. I grew up here in Florida, and so thunderstorms and lightning and hurricanes have always been something that have fascinated me. So I think overall it's a great science. It's one of those where it's, it's almost the marriage of science and art, so to speak, because you're actually seeing what's happening with the science itself. Kind of weird, but have, have you ever been in a dangerous uh, weather situation? Hurricane Tornado lightning? Uh, yes, I actually was still, I was living down here during the time of Hurricane Andrew, which I often credit for probably being one of the biggest factors in deciding that this was something that I would love to do. Um, in terms of tornadoes, oftentimes tornadoes can form here in South Florida and sometimes we are not even aware that they're occurring. For instance, I believe maybe about a month or to a month and a half ago, there was a tornado that went through plantation only just a couple miles west of here. So, in terms of extreme events, I'm a fan. Do we get tsunamis or and or floods here? We do get floods here because, as you may be aware, Florida is actually, for the majority of Florida anyhow, we are at sea level. So it really doesn't take much in order to induce a flood. Strong winds can sometimes bring a lot of sand or water up along the coastal areas. And heavy periods of rain associated with strong events such as a, a hurricane, a slow moving hurricane or tropical cyclone or any kind of even a tropical storm system, which although they are small and it, well, I, when I say small, I mean in terms of they're not quite hurricanes. These can produce very strong rains, especially if they're slow-moving systems. So the hurricanes make storm surges, right? What's that? Now, the storm surge is actually the most deadly association with a hurricane because this is a mass movement of water into a region that may not be prepared for that. So sometimes you can have water that is able to breach a seawall and move into a location. The storm drains may not be quite ready to handle the amount of flow that's coming in, and this definitely can produce and uh, exacerbate any local flooding that's occurring. How did you become a meteorologist and teach education to kids about it? Um, well, here in Florida, we have a lot of great schools, and the one school that I chose to go to for their meteorology program was Florida State, which has one of the top meteorology schools in the nation. And I went there for my bachelor's and decided to stay on for my master's degree to do more research and work with hurricane and the physical structure of the ice properties and how this could actually change what's going on with the system itself. Um, for any you know, most people that you speak to are often going to tell you that they have a fascination with weather. Whether or not your mom would let you go outside and play, uh, to what you're going to wear for the day, these are all things that are dictated by what's happening with weather. So I believe that it's one of those things that kids really enjoy because, again, you can run outside and you can see what's actually happening. Um, I decided to go to school and I stuck with it and I really enjoyed the whole program through the process. So what type of degree for meteorology? I have a bachelor's degree in meteorology and I did go onwards to get my master's in meteorology and also obtained a minor in math and physics along the way. So I would advise that for anybody that is interested to going into the field, um, be prepared for a lot of math and a lot of physics. It's really got nothing to do with going outside and identifying clouds as much as it's figuring out the physics and the processes behind how those clouds formed and the potential for what those clouds can do. Do you have like volcanoes or any mud or rock slides here in Florida? We do not have volcanoes uh, near us here in Florida, so this is not necessarily an, um, an active threat that we have to worry about here. In terms of mudslides, because we are a pretty flat state, with heavy rains, moving mud, this is usually the problem with mudslides, uh, we don't really have to deal with that so much. So flooding really is our biggest concern. But no rock slides either? No rock slides. So. 
back last summer, I made one of these at the Richard C. Sylvian Public Library of Wilton Manors, where I volunteer at every Thursday and Friday. And I went to the weather program because of life science, where I met Mr. Dana at. She's going to show you how to make one of these tornadoes. This is a fire tornado, which is my favorite. So one of the interactive things that kids often find fine is being able to make a tornado at home. So if you find a small jar, you can either purchase a small mason jar or even use a pickle jar or a juice jar or a jam jar at home. Once it's empty, what you would want to do is fill it with water and then potentially add whatever it is that you'd like your tornado to have. So in this particular case, Elijah added sand to represent here us being in Florida. Uh, we also added a little bit of debris in terms of moss and grass. Uh, we also added a few small plastic houses, much like you can find them in a, in a Monopoly set or a dollhouse. And if you add those in, I believe that he also added some yellow or red and maybe a combination of two to make the orange kind of color. You don't need to add any of those things, but you can also get very creative on what else you add. I've had previous participants add things like glitter, um, anything that you would like to see in your tornado. I've had some students even put things in like uh, mixing more than one color in order to make a night tornado. So once you have put all of the ingredients in the jar, make sure that you tighten it very tight and you can get an adult to help you because you don't want to have to clean up this mess if you don't. And once you get this, what you will do is find that if you turn this and make sure that you get your wrist in there, you can actually show exactly how this motion occurs and the more that you shake it, the more that you can actually see that tornadic activity in the water itself. So that was my interview with Mr. Dana. Mr. Dana, thank you very much. Thank we you very appreciate, much. I appreciate your time. Yes, I was happy to do this. Thanks for watching this episode of Adventurous Kids.